Good morning and welcome to Acme Canines Coffee Chat, the place where you gain tips and advice on caring for your dog. Happy September 9th. I'm Laura Pecos and I'm the host of Coffee Chat. You know, there's so much to know about dogs and there's even a terminology associated with them. I thought today we would kind of talk about a little bit of it. For example, did you know that when a dog takes a position of stretching both its hind legs behind them, it's called spluting. Now, aside from the fact that this offers a very comfortable position for the dog, um, one of the reasons they think a dog does this is because it kind of stretches out their whole body. Kind of neat. So, you know, when you see your dog doing that, it, don't worry about it. It's just relaxing and kind of strengthening its, its muscles. Also, here's another one. Uh, when a dog curls up in a, a ball position, like when for sleeping, you call it in cressel. And this is an old Scottish expression that is derived uh, from the words that mean an untidy bundle of clothes or anything else. So, well, my dog's in a cressel right now. And then you know they're, they're tied up. So what about a dog that sets off a low deep bark? Like it's called a boof or chuff. And it, it usually it's kind of a warning bark before it really starts the real thing. I have a, now so we have a little quiz for you. What do you call nose, dog nose prints on the inside of like car windows, uh, patio doors, mirrors, glass reflective surfaces? Any ideas? I'll tell you at the end of the show. September 13th is Pet Birth Defect Awareness Day. It was uh, originally established in 2014 by David Rogers of the MB Jungle Foundation. He wanted to bring awareness to the public about the interactive role humans play with our pets and how their uh, physical birth defects can affect the, the well-being of their mental health. Um, so I talked with Shirley Zindler, who is a uh, retired animal control officer and the founder of Dogwood Animal Rescue Project in Sonoma County, California. Shirley had this to say about owning a dog with a disability. We adopt out quite a few dogs with disabilities and they can range from blindness, deafness, uh, amputees, um, you know, illnesses, other problems. Uh, there's even something called uh, hypobellar cell. Excuse me. Oh my gosh, the, the name was just on my tongue and then it's gone. Uh, cerebellar hypoplasia. Um, that's that's basically uh, leaves them with a wobbly gait and and a little bit um, needing just a little bit of extra help. And and we've adopted out dogs with all of those things. Um, fairly recently even and most of the time they do so well um, they can still make such good companions we just uh, the most recent adoption was a deaf dog um, and we we do quite a few deaf dogs and most of the time we find that deaf dogs can learn as quickly as hearing dogs they just you know we teach them sign instead of instead of voice commands and uh, most of them are just they just pick it up so fast and you start rewarding them for looking at your face or looking at your hands. And there's so many uh, options out there now too. so many uh, resources for people adopting a pet with disabilities, such as, you know, places selling custom made wheelchairs or carts for dogs with mobility issues. Uh, there's um, special collars that you can buy for deaf dogs that have a re remote vibration. And you can teach the dog to look at you when they feel the vibration. And that way you can then do your hand signal for calm or whatever. Um, and even blind dogs, you know, they just really learn to find their way around. And what we do, of course, with blind dogs is we advise our adopters, you know, be careful about moving furniture, maybe walk the dog through on the leash and, and let them see any, see, let them adjust to any changes um, that they might, you know, that they might expect um, with with moving furniture and that kind of thing but it's amazing how well most of them do that's yeah this, i i think that's where you know we, we see it as a disability but i think the dog it doesn't really see that they just use their other senses um i remember one dog um it was it was blind and deaf so it was a little bit harder but we ended up using um different kinds of uh, 
essence, I want to call it, you know, it's like vanilla and that type of thing at different doorways. So the dog knew where things were at, but I'm not even sure they even needed that because it seemed like they adjust because they don't have the distraction of the outside world. And so it's so much easier to train in that sense that at least from my angle, that's what I saw. Yeah, absolutely. You know, a lot of those dogs are just not, um, yeah, they're not distracted by exterior sounds if they're deaf. Um, even the, you know, the, the dogs that are blind and deaf, which we see quite a bit with that lethal merle gene, uh, those dogs can learn commands from touch. You know, you think of, you know, Helen Keller learning things, um, you know, from touch and being able to navigate her world incredibly. Dogs are just as capable. Dogs don't, you know, come with the emotional baggage normally of, of worrying about their disability or wishing they were different. And so we find that so many of them do really well and make delightful companions and, and the people really enjoy them. Are there, are there places in California where people, like say someone that has a dog like this, that they can take them to that will help them train the dog? I know there's a lot of resources like on Facebook. I don't know of any specific place per se, but I know there are uh, Facebook pages designed just for dogs that are, you know, blind or just for dogs that are deaf. Some are for dogs with a variety of disabilities. Um, I've even seen for blind dogs this little halo thing that um, attaches to the collar, and it has a, it has like this almost like a little hula hoop thing out front, and the dog learns to when he feels the push of the collar, meaning the halo is bumped into something, they learn to to redirect. Um, but there's so many resources, like I said, online, if you, you know, if you research, you know, adopting a blind dog, adopting a deaf dog, that kind of thing that are so helpful. It's, it's really a, it's a better time than ever to, to do that. What type of person would you say, you know, should avoid a dog with a disability? You know, it, it really depends on the person and the dog. Um, I mean, there are some people that just want to be able to do absolutely everything in the regular way with dogs. Obviously, they should stick with the, the, the regular dogs. And there's certainly plenty of those in need of homes. But um, most people, you know, we've seen people that have adopted dogs that later went blind or deaf. And most people can adapt to it better than they think. Um, you know, if you were going to be, you know, uh, training for a marathon, you probably wouldn't adopt an amputee because they maybe can't, you know, don't have the stamina of a dog with, you know, all four legs or that kind of thing. Um, it just depends on what you want in a companion as far as, you know, what you need them to be able to do. We have a dog in our program right now that has an undiagnosed uh, disorder. We've had him to every kind of specialist. He's kind of a youngish dog. He's very limited in his mobility. Like his joints are all super stiff, but he's not arthritic. And he's um, he's so sweet and easy. Like we call him the champion couch potato. He's a youngish dog. He may not have a long lifespan. We don't, we don't even know what to expect yet. We're still trying to get a diagnosis. And again, working with numerous veterinarians and specialists and tests. But the beauty of him is he's happy. He's friendly. He's so good natured. His name is Gusto. You can see him on our Dogwood Animal Rescue Facebook page. He's just so good natured. He's so easy. He doesn't get into trouble. He just he greets people with a wagging tail, and he likes to play tug and that kind of thing. And yet, he can't walk easily more than, you know, 10, 15 steps at a time. And then he, you know, then he wants a little rest. But, you know, he's house trained and crate trained, and we take him out to potty. We usually carry him down any kind of stairs. Um, but he's, you know, he's pretty impacted by his disability as far as he's not super mobile. But in the right household, this dog would make a lovely companion. And, of course, he's, you know, he's not, um, again, we don't know what his lifespan is going to be. Uh, we've adopted out dogs like this before. And when we ask the adopters, why did you consider a dog like this when they're not going to be able to do all the normal dog things? The answer has always been because they deserve love, too. And yet, people like that often end up, getting more out of the dog than they give the dog, which is a beautiful thing. That truly is. That's very nice. I know um, National Blind Dog Day is coming up. That was one reason why I, I asked you, you know, to talk about this because so often you, you know, you turn and you 
see animals and you think, oh, I don't know if I could handle this, but you've made it very known that, that people can handle it if they want to. So that I appreciate you talking about that. As Shirley mentioned, owning a dog with a disability isn't for everyone, but it, it isn't that hard if you want to you know, put the time and effort into it. These dogs are loving and kind, can lead wonderful lives. So just, if you can open up your heart, adopt a dog with a disability and they will love you forever. Well, September 14th is National Hug Your Hound Day. Uh, it is uh, observing your dog from his point of view, uh, in his environment and also in everyday life. And as you celebrate, uh, it's something to remember about uh, keeping our animals healthy, happy, and safe. Now, dogs have certain needs that you must fulfill for them, and it's, and it's necessary to keep them balanced and well-rounded. Maslow's hierarchy of needs is, uh, I'm going to read this, uh, it's a theory that explains the multiple levels of human needs. It says that utilitarian needs come first. Physical needs such as food, water, and shelter take precedence over the mental and emotional ones. If you can't eat, well, nothing else really matters, does it? Uh, once these necessities have been met, though, the abstract needs become very much more important. And this fact holds true for our canine companions as well. Your, pro your dog probably gets enough food and has a wonderful home to live in. So if they're not being fulfilled in the abstract ways, such as um, mental stimulation, uh, you know, going for walks, different things like that, then you cannot truly have a happy, balanced dog. So in recognition of National Hug Your Hound Day, this part of Coffee Chat will discuss some of the more common myths around dogs. Fact or fiction, older dogs cannot be taught new tricks. Well, that's fiction. A dog is never too old to learn a basic command or a trick. In fact, they flourish when they're trained and they love the mental stimulation. Also, elderly dogs that aren't housebroken or house, can be house trained and with a lot of success. It just takes commitment, patience, consistency, and sometimes some yummy treats. As long as you can keep your dog inspired and his physical and mental state are well enough that he can do basic tricks or commands, well, um, your dog should have no problem learning no matter what his age. In fact, I trained an aggressive 13-year-old Jack Russell Terrier to be a well-mannered dog for the neighborhood. And with his owner's help, this only took us six weeks. So it's not like forever but you can work with it and you just need to know what to do. Now, here's another one. Fact or fiction, all dogs should like being near each other. Well, that's fiction. Not every human is an extrovert and dogs are the same way. How social dogs are uh, sometimes depends on their socialization as a puppy, their breeding, or simply just their temperament. Some dogs just don't like being around other dogs. We did some research, and if you'd like to figure out if your dog is an introvert or extrovert, you can check out Wag Walking, and they have a, a blog on different things to see called Can Dogs Be Introverts? Fact or fiction, dog's sense of smell is very powerful. Well, that is a fact. We know dogs have a powerful sense of smell, and while we can just smell a, maybe a spoonful of sugar in a cup of tea, our canine friends are capable of sm smelling that same spoonful in two olympic size swimming pools of water. Here again, we did a little bit of research and learned that there is a canine olfactory research and education laboratory in, at Texas Tech University. Nathaniel Hall is the director and I'm going to read some things that he states about, about dogs. Dogs and other animals have better smelling skills than humans because of the structure of their nose. Instead of breathing in and out the same openings, each nostril is separated and opens for breathing in and out. Not only that, but each nostril operates independently, so it captures different smells from different directions but a more complex dog nose is not the reason 
that we smell so poorly. It's not just a large amount of receptors that allows animals to detect a wider variety of odors. As humans, our sense of smell really isn't that bad, he's saying. It, it's also differences in behavior that affect how our sense of smell is. Dogs always have their nose to the ground, especially on walks, when humans want to just keep on walking. We really don't take the time to sniff anything for more than a few moments, says Ms. Dr. Hall, while dogs will deeply investigate with many, many, many sniffs. While your nose will never be as powerful as a dog's, it wouldn't hurt to give it a little bit of credit. Consider on your next dog walk, taking an adventure in discovering the new smells. Join your dog in both sights and scents along the way. Uh, if this is something of interest to you and you want to learn some more about it, you can read about um, Dr. Hall and the dog sense of smell on bechewy.com. Fact or fiction? A wagging tail does not always mean a dog is happy. Fact. A wagging tail isn't always a happy, gr welcome greeting. Dogs, dogs wag their tails for numerous reasons, including being nervous or feeling threatened. As a dog trainer, we, we watch the postures of dogs, where, how their tail is raised, where they're, um, you know, how if it's stiff or if it's very relaxed. This helps us to understand the dogs much better. Um, dogs use their tails to express their emotions and feelings. Uh, unfortunately, some dogs may have dock tails or no tail at all, and so it's very difficult for them uh, to express this, but that, watch their dog's tail. Here again, if you'd like more information on this topic, check out Acme Canine, Understanding the Secret Language of Dogs, Tail to Tail. Fact or fiction? Dogs suffer from jealousy. Well, that's a fact. Uh, they're, they're just like us in that sense. And they, there was a group of scientists in California and these researchers studied 36 dogs from 14 breeds and they found that most were really indifferent to their, their owners up until the point that their owner showed attention to a stuffed dog. Then the dogs growled and snapped at the, pup, at the stuffed dog. Pretty interesting. Um, we have an uh, article on our website. Uh, it's called Understanding Dog Jealousy and How to Deal with This. Because really, uh, you want your dog not to be jealous all the time. I mean, that's not a very good behavior. And just like in humans, you want to tone it down. So check it out and you can learn some things and get some techniques on how to help your dog not be so, so jealous. Here's the last one. Fact or fiction? Your dog is punishing you when he chews on your shoes or destroys your furniture. Well, it's fiction. Dogs don't think in terms of getting even or punishment. As we know, chewing really helps a dog uh, when they're bored, it feels good on their teeth, um, it releases excess energy, and many times it's like a pacifier. You know, it's like children suck their thumb when they get a little bit anxious or nervous. Dogs chew on things, and so you shouldn't, you shouldn't really punish them for it because there is a reason for it, but you really need to redirect them to some good chewing toys, such as Nyla Bones. For more information on chewing, check out Acme Canine Chewing and Toys to Help. Should help you out with that. Well, how did you do on, on this test? Remember, you can learn a great deal of information on canine behavior and training by visiting Acme Canine's blog. It's better than buying a book because you can actually search the topic and the information is given to you in tidbits rather than having to read an entire book to find out something on the, on the topic. So that's acmecanine.com. Check it out. We're almost done with the show and I promised that I would give you the answer to the question, what is the word for a dog's nose print on the inside of car windows, on, you know, patios, other reflective surface? Well, check out my shirt, Pupkiss, that's the answer. And you can order this shirt on our website. So check out our, our shop. There's three different ways to, to purchase things online. We have uh, great dog training material. We have products that are approved that we've tested and, and dogs love them and dog owners love them and we give you the reasons why. And then we also have Dig Direct where you can get shirts like this. 
I appreciate you tuning in and listening. And for now, I wish you and your dogs a very happy Thursday. All the best.